That's too stressful for me. I oh, just, no. I is this? Do, when I was in research. Yeah, and I'm good. How are you? Good, good. how are you? Research yeah. anxiety. Yeah. 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 Experience yeah. Yeah. God, we were, we, we work with technology mm -hmm. and it's cutting edge. I yeah. I, I just started doing it about six months ago. I, really? I kind of did it as a trial thing and to see if I could live with it, and, and so far I'm. And I have it backed up to the cloud each yeah. night, and then put it the backed up separately. So it's like I have a dual backup system. And well, what happens when you get that infamous yeah. virus that just eats everything alive? Well, since I have them backed up, sh I should be able to get those backups back if I have to start with a whole new computer. So, and I've had that happen where my computers crashed and I was able to recover. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to be comfortable you can recover if you crash. And, you know, I have had... putting users here. Oh, this could get nasty. <laughs> Anyone understands what you're doing. Good evening. Good evening. We're going to call the October 1, 2015 meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to order. And if the administrator would call the roll. Anderson? Present. Bagelman? Here. Dane? Here. User? Here. Olson? Here. Payne? Here. Solheim? Wilson? Okay, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Any additions, corrections? We have approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Hearing no further, those in favor say yes. 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 Those opposed, no. And the motion is carried. The agenda is approved as presented. The uh, minutes of the September 3, 2015 meeting are included in your packets. Uh, are there any additions or corrections to those? Move approval. We have a motion. Second. Or we have a second. Just want to draw your attention to page three in the minutes. Uh, there's a really good uh, discussion of the progress we're making with the corridor planning. And uh, you may want to kind of take that and keep it for future for future reference. So it's it's a good piece. Any other discussion on the on the uh, minutes? If not, those in favor of approval say yes. 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 Those opposed, no. And the minutes are approved as presented. Communications, Ben. Uh, Board of Adjustment minutes are included. Um, you'll see another request has come forward. For a, um, a detached uh, diesel storage tank in East Bremer Avenue, very similar to the one that they heard in, uh, before, and you see in our agenda for tonight, we'll discuss something about that as far as an ordinance amendment to address diesel tank location. 
There's also a, a driveway width uh, variance requested, which is customary for variances in the municipal design standards that come before the Board of Adjustments. Um, so that was approved. Very good. Any other comments of that? Okay, we'll move to public hearings. This is the date and the place of the public hearing on rezoning request from A1 to R1 for one lot in the 100 block of 12th Street Northeast. Lance Gritters, applicant, is requesting a zoning change for property located on the east side of 12th Street Northeast in the 100 block. The request is to change the existing A1 agriculture district zoning to R1 single family residential district to reflect intended usage for a residential property. Comprehensive land use map designates the property as residential. Following public notice through mailings to those within 250 feet and posting in the local newspaper, at least two weeks in advance, the commission will consider all public comment prior to recommending action to the city council. Uh, ben, have you received anything on this particular uh, question before we go to the public hearing? Uh, no, I have not received any correspondence on this after we sent it out about two weeks ago. Would, would you, for the benefit of all of us, uh, would you put up the chart for the, uh, the plot that we're talking about, the one that's, I think it's the beacon okay. chart? I've, uh, I've provided the, air, or the uh, zoning map uh, currently as it stands today Perfect. for the audience and also for the commission to just double check. But the X uh, indicates it's uh, on, the, on the text where um, it ends in 001 is the parcel in question here. The, the, the thing I wanted you to comment on is where the property uh, comes uh, up to the, uh, the road, the street, uh, it's an unusual configuration. Would you just give a little bit of background on that? I remember we, we visited this property some time back. I'll, uh, I'll grab a, um, a quick visual, and I know the applicant is here who is, is well-versed in the, in the property, so maybe I'll just let him take it from there, and then if he needs assistance, I'll let him... Okay, and then you decide. after you answer the question, then we'll go ahead and open the public hearing and give you a chance to give an overview sure. of the project. Sure, sure. Sounds good. Good evening, everybody. Um, I am the applicant, Lance Graders. Um, I do not own the property yet, but we do have a purchase agreement in place. The property owner is Charlotte Menzel, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, but I am here to represent as the requesting party. Um, the specific question about, I guess, kind of the oddity, um, my understanding is that when Bridal Spur was platted, this road was originally supposed to go straight up. And so it would have gone adjacent to those two properties. And that the original plat map indicated that same thing. At some point, um, the road was, was moved over, which created these small little parcels. Yeah, created these, these this little adjacent parcels essentially locking those properties in without any access to 12th Street. And so I'm going to ask you to use the display that's oh. on the overhead. That sure. way, what you're pointing at will be gotcha. seen by the people that are watching gotcha. at home. Yep. So yeah, I think initially the road was supposed to run right there, which would have provided access to 12th Street for both of those parcels. And for some reason, that, that road was, was curved over. And so essentially it, it locked those properties in from having access. And um, at some point, the, uh, I think it was uh, Happels owned that property right there. And they then owned yet the, the small parcels adjacent to 12th Street. They subsequently sold that property to another owner. And eventually a deal was struck where he sold that smaller little triangle piece to the owner of the property directly to the north, uh, who's a sister of the person who I'm buying from. Her name is, is Dorothy. And she granted an access and utility easement to her sister over that smaller triangle and a small section of her lot. OK, and, that, and that's preserved then in what we're dealing with tonight? Yes, the, the property in question does have a easement. I believe it's 30 feet. Wide. Currently 30 feet. 30 feet, and so that's sufficient for one residence. Um, so it, it satisfies our zoning code requirement on that. It's just one of those little anomalies that we get into. 
Are there any other uh, pieces from the commission in terms of the exhibits before we go to the public hearing? I would be curious, Ben, where is the 30-foot easement? Is it on? It's the south 30 feet of that small triangle. Okay. Okay. And then it also carves out over a, a, a triangle sort of roughly here over the larger parcel, again, 30 feet. So it gives a 30 feet strip across both of them to access right down in there. So, yeah, just, just to reiterate what he said, I actually took some time, kind of sketched it out. There we go. So, and basically what this is showing, um, <clears throat> 30 foot access is the dark color. Um, so basically it cuts across uh, meets up and then it juts down so that there's sufficient uh, angle and width so that he has access here. And then if someday, you know, Lance and I were kind of tossing around the idea of, well, if it is ever subdivided, whatever, um, we would require that to be bumped up to 50 foot. But for what we're doing tonight, one access, one residence, we're perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. And it has ample uh, water and sewer connection available there too through that easement as well. And who owns currently the parcel that I'm going to say is number 12. So we're talking about this one here. I that belongs to the Shepherds who own 106. Right. Yeah. I think it's 106 East Bremers, the, uh, or excuse me, 12 is the address there. Mm -hmm. And that goes with 12. It's shown as parcel T here, according to the assessor or the auditor's plat map. Okay. If there's nothing further in terms of this, Lance, if you'd stay... Uh, we will open the, uh, the public hearing and uh, invite you to uh, sort of give us an overview of what it is you're looking to do. Um, what we're intending to do is currently my wife and I actually own um, a, a house in Bridalspur Court and we're intending to uh, build a bigger house. We had our third child uh, about nine months ago and so need a bigger house. So right now the intention is to put in a private drive there. We intend to put a, a single family residence there a little further back on the property. And, and that's the only uh, plan that we have for right now. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to make comment on this project at this time? Yes, please come up, state your name please. And you, you can either use right the mic the there, there or right. either mic. Yeah, my name is uh, Jeff Rommel. I live on uh, Bridal Spur, and I'm just here to understand kind of what's happening. And so I guess my question is, I know, um, what, what would it take to subdivide that and put multiple houses on that property besides the single family? What, where, where is there control of what can go on that property once it's uh, residential? Well, that's a good question. I can address that. In doing what I do, I handle a lot of that platting and subdivision basic minimums requirements. Um, so what we're doing tonight is the first step to place a house on the property. After tonight, um, if the, you know, and then it goes to city council for readings, and then if it's approved, it stands, they can construct one residence on the property. If they want to do uh, one additional residence, what we would look for is water sewer connectivity, access to the 12th Street, and you kind of followed hopefully a little bit what we were explaining at the onset, or what yeah. I was trying to show is that we would need to beef up the entrance, um, we have examples of other private subdivisions in the community. Um, so they would be allowed to go down to, if they wanted to, 9,000 square feet per lot if okay. they wanted to. Um, but again, it would come before this body and then the city council for ultimate approval and we would do another. Um, so I would be, noti I mean, I'm, I'm within whatever distance feet notification. Well, and that's a good question. Now on a, um, a rezoning like tonight, you are notified. Okay. But on a subdivision request such as that, you will not be notified. Okay. That's not in our requirements. Okay. Okay. Um, and then how does that relate to, you know, there's another piece almost identical to it above. W what, what can that person, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the rest of that subdivision that's, uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, which, which way is north and south. But north you know, that, up, yeah. Yeah, north is up, thanks. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a subdivision where the road ends. Mm -hmm. Are they planning on coming down and around or? Um, good know, how, good how question. Does, how does what? He's, you know, he's planning on doing affect that other prop piece good, of land. Good question. And years ago, uh, what you're referring to on the north on the north end there is High Point First Edition. Okay. Um, and then that would be a 
High Point 3rd Edition is what you're referring to, that whole uh, bigger area there that ends in 016. Yeah, yeah, right there. Had a square piece. Yeah. What they envision doing is cul de sacking that as well. Okay. Um, so terminating the roadway if and when they continue that. I know. Uh, yeah, you, terminating within this piece yes. of property somewhere? Yes. Mm -hmm. So then what, what about this? What, is that, what does that do with this one? Well, to be honest, that one's still open. It's just sitting there, right? That so, one's just sitting there, yep. And it won't connect into this subdivision necessarily. So no. unless somebody comes along and wants to build right. a, a home, one home on it or whatever. Okay. Yeah, and and so what? And with topography, for, if you're familiar with the topography too, it really drops down substantially yeah, into drop, a ravine yeah. there. Yeah. So, you know, when um, I know the applicant and I were talking about that a little bit, not necessarily property to the north here, but on the one that ends in 001, the subject property tonight, um, the yeah. one he's looking to construct the one house on it. Topography wise, it's really I think hard to fit in more than. Frankly, two homes. Yeah, Any okay. more than that, it'd be really tight. Yeah, well, that was kind of my question is what. And I know the applicant kind of desires some space too, so yeah. I don't know if he wants neighbors. So. <laughs> okay, good. Um, but but just to share with you, yeah, so that was shown uh, with every subdivision when that comes forward to this body and their council. We, we expect them to show kind of phantom lines of it continuing out to say, if it were to be continued, how would it look? Yeah. So that we can make a better educated decision. Is this plat a good idea if it leads to that? And the answer was yes at that time. So it was envisioned as ending in a cul-de-sac, kind of a dead end cul-de-sac. Okay. okay, good, thank you. <laughs> Is there anyone else in the audience who would want to make a comment? Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing and uh, let's talk about it up here. <coughs> Questions, comments? I might just need a refresher. When we this was brought in front of us a couple of years ago, what was what was the the reason that we were reviewing this these two parcels? Does anybody remember? hasn't been since I've been on, so it must have been over three years ago. You know what I'm thinking of is um, you see the there's a little triangular part onto the north there. Is that one? That that was a result, I think, of a decision perhaps reached uh, between the two property owners, the ones that uh, separated 12th Street from these properties, and that they didn't really have access uh, to at all to the south. Litigation, yeah, I believe there was there was litigation that settled ultimately. Um, so I don't know if it came in front of you as a result of that litigation or so because of the dispute. I can't remember. And I'm not sure if, was it with me or was it my predecessor perhaps? No, it, it was it was okay. here was and it, it here? was about the entrance. Okay. Mm -hmm. It and was at the entrance. I tried to go entrance. back and find notes and I couldn't. Okay. It was so at the entrance what year we it was. had. It was interesting because I don't believe the person that requested that we give it um, approval was an owner and didn't own it. And that was one of the times that I said no. This is wrong. Thank you. I, I just couldn't recall. So, so the result of the way it is today is that the parcel that ends in 001, the subject property tonight, the south property we're looking at, they do have access, I think maybe as a result of some of that, perhaps. Could be. Any other comments, questions? Are you ready for a motion? I'd move that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend approval of the zoning change for the property described on the east side of 12th Street Northeast from A1 to R1 to the City Council. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? If not, those in favor say yes. 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 Those opposed, no. And the motion is carried. We're going to move on to regular business, review the final plat for High Point 2nd Edition for 15 residential lots in Northeast Waverly. Waverly Real Estate, Inc. applicant is requesting a final subdivision plat for 15 residential lots known as High Point 2nd Edition, located west of the current High Point 1st Edition extended. A comprehensive land use map shows these properties as residential. This plat follows the submission and approval of the preliminary plat as approved by the City Council. Ben, have you had anything come in on this? I know um, it's not a public hearing, and it's just regular business, but... No, and that's a good question, and I know, um, I think the applicant may be represented tonight, but I was just going to add that there's some minor changes from the first plat that you saw. Um, feel free to chime in out there in case I'm missing something. 
because um, I know that we looked at the water tower uh, that would be uh, labeled as water tower right behind lots two and three to the north of those. Mm -hmm. um, we were noting that uh, the drainage of that and, and frankly access seemed like it would be better served in a different fashion. So what you see is a tract B uh, that's labeled there uh, just between four and five. That would actually be given, I believe, to the city of Waverly for purposes of uh, access and so forth and, and possible drainage of overflow. I think my terminology is correct there. Um, and the other, uh, let's see, the other changes, that's the only one that really comes to mind. And then I know in the restrictive covenants, uh, we just changed a couple of things. One of them was, um, they, I think it was reviewed that the ability was trying, I guess was, was, um, was laid out that should somebody decide to build on two lots at once, that that could be permissive, uh, but at, at the city staff level, we thought that may not be appropriate in this case. Um, and the rationale for that was usually at the time of these lots being platted, there's infrastructure being put in and, and services stubs to each of those lots. And so then we would have to retroactively go back and uh, expect that those uh, potential areas that could leak in the future, those services that are stubbed for the main be capped at the main. And so what that would mean is digging into a, a relatively newer street or a street that would be maintained by the city. And so to avoid potential uh, impacts to that, um, it was agreed upon that that would be removed from the covenants. So that's a change that you'll see in the covenants tonight. Um, and to my knowledge, I think that's pretty much it. Um, you're seeing the plat for, uh, tonight. Um, they're gonna finalize the construction documents and all everything. Uh, as early as tomorrow, I understand, uh, at the staff level, we're going to review everything and finalize it and get it ready for October 19 or the third Monday in October, whenever that is. So. And with that being said, are there any questions? Just curious what that uh, kind of odd-shaped little piece to the... Uh, I guess it would be the east of lots 10 and 11 there. It says tract A. Mm -hmm. what, what is that? That's going to be a uh, water detention area. Okay. Um, again, uh, dedicated to the city. Um, and it borderline, fun it, it will function as a open green space for parkland dedication. Uh, in addition to the sidewalk network that's being constructed with the street being platted and each new home constructed. So that was agreed upon by the Leisure Services Commission that that would be green space that could serve this area. Other questions? Uh, ben, that was uh, tract A of the second edition? Uh, yes. And tract A of the first is also green space, correct? Uh, yes. Any particular reason that was necessary? Because I think that first edition tract A is quite large. I know that, frankly, the, the principal reason for tract A being shown for a second edition, I understand, is for engineering and water detention purposes. And it just so happens it would also function as extra green space, unless I'm missing, misinforming you from what uh, the developer, I guess, was envisioning. But I know it was just generally agreed upon that the uh, green space for detention would, would be better served to expand it a little bit more and perhaps encompass actually probably what is green space today. And the result is a little extra green space for uh, parks and open space. Or more former to take care of. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, I move that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend approval of the final plat creating 15 residential lots in High Point, second edition on the, to the City Council. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor indicate yes. 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 Those opposed, no. The motion is carried. Thank you. Well, I have to tell you that the uh, developer was pretty savvy on this. 
asking you. Would you would you please speak, would you please speak into the mic because <laughs> people would like to hear this at home. <laughs> hey, next item. Regular business is to review ordinance amendments governing fuel tank setbacks in M1 and M2 zoning districts. City requirements call for fuel tanks in M1 to be underground and 200 feet from R district property lines and 200 feet from R district property lines in M2 zoning. Staff is following through on the recommendation of the Board of Adjustments to compare the city code requirements with the state of Iowa. Uh, uh, fire marshal and international fire code and building code standards to see what, if any, adjustments may be made to the code. Following a review of the building code requirements and comparing with other communities and their codes on this matter, staff is recommending the amendments provided by th staff to be made to the code to lessen the setbacks to, to better match the minimum standards found elsewhere. You've got a fair amount of material on this. There's a paper that was put together um, from the, uh, the Board of Adjustment. You've got their minutes, which have the, uh, the, the gist of the discussion. Uh, one, uh, one minor correction in the, uh, the, the write-up, uh, the paragraph beginning city requirements call, the uh, fourth line down, it's Board of Adjustment, singular, not adjustments. It's very, very minor. Whiteout will suffice. Okay. So let's talk about this a bit. Then one of the things that I see in the, uh, in the supplemental sheet that came out, item 14, they talk about you, you've, you've done, I think, a good job in showing us what was removed and what was added. Mm -hmm. But the original said not to exceed 25,000 gallons, and we're moving to 2,000 gallons. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. You, would you like me just to kind of walk you through really mm -hmm. quick on yeah, the rationale really and the history? Okay. Mm -hmm. So this, this again started with a request on East Bremer Avenue. I think um, kind of, you know, I think maybe we're familiar with it. It's going to be on the furthest East Bremer location south of the, um, there's a milling place uh, and the farthest east on East Bremer there. And then on the south side, there is some storage of, of tanks, of LP tanks, and there's some bulk storage of diesel tanks now. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's a couple of properties that have that type of use on them, and then backing up to them is residential, which came after um, those were annexed into the city years ago, uh, and then it was plat is rezoned and then platted uh, for condos. Well, when we started looking into this, it was kind of discussed that well, maybe there ought to be a different way to think about this instead of the 200 feet from an R district property line was envisioned or a fuel tank that would be visually uh, impacting negatively perhaps the property that's zoned residentially and also that would come after the fact. In this case, we had a condition where that really wasn't the case because we have a visual barrier that's a berm and um, uh, mature evergreen trees that would provide year-round visual barrier. And then the question became setback uh, from the R district. Well, if the truly <coughs> setback requirement was in place for safety reasons, maybe there ought to be a way to reflect that in the code because the code actually really is above and beyond that that is required by the state fire marshal requirements and building code requirements <coughs> for the type of fuels uh, being stored. There's different volatility levels. So in talking with the state fire marshal office and talking with our building code inspector and then researching some other communities, what we discovered is what we can do to accomplish the same visual uh, barrier and accomplish a relatively safe way of locating uh, bulk storage tanks depending on their volatility, that's handled through the building code standards and, and state fire marshal standards. So perhaps we already have a visual barrier standard that kicks in anyhow whenever you put in something new, a new tank, so that would trigger the need to put in because you're impacting more than what was there, so that would be in place not only in this case, but you think of other applications on M2 around the community. And it's, that, that's a kind of a unique situation, but we, we're paying close attention to the other M1 and M2 properties. So what we have here is, and I'll walk you through it, 
Um, when we apply this, uh, what, we, what we're proposing is instead of calling it from the R district line, we want to do it from the R district uh, uh, main structure. And what that means is if you have a setback required of 30 feet from a rear setback line in the R district and you're enforcing a rear setback in the industrial already, we're just saying you go a little bit above and beyond the customary 80 feet that you may get resulting, for example, if a 50-foot setback is enforced on the industrial side and a 30-foot is on, enforced on the residential side, 30 plus 50 is 80, what we're asking is we want that a little more farther away just to ensure that it, it meets our basic minimum uh, safety standards. And actually, it's more in concert with, um, so it's a little bit above and beyond the state fire marshal standards, but it's not overly burdensome where somebody who has a 200-foot depth property would be not able to find a location. So... That's kind of what this reflects. And again, the uh, going down from 25,000 gallons uh, tank uh, down to 2,000 gallons would be basically indicating that if you're going to put anything above 2,000 gallons, we want you to go to the Board of Adjustment and have that reviewed to say that's a rather large substantial structure that may exceed more than building code standards maybe you're really envisioning. So at that time, let's call public hearing just so there's notice given. We'll still enforce a visual barrier standard, but we just want to double check on the setback standard. So that was the rationale for that. And then on the M2, um, something similar to that is we're adding, um, uh, let's see, we want to actually exclude tanks less than 2,000 gallons. We don't really necessarily think that's appropriate if you're storing a 500-gallon diesel tank for fleet vehicles because that's already addressed your building code standards. So let's just exclude that. Um, and so we're... The result would be a situation where if you're going to put in something that's rather substantial, more than 2,000 gallons, we want you to come to the Board of Adjustments if you're in the M1 district. But if you're in the M2, generally, we really are not interested unless you reach, you know, more than the 2,000 again. You know, like out there right now, those are more than 2,000 gallon tanks out there. Uh, I think they're each 2,000 gallons. Mm -hmm. And you're referring to, I think, the Dilvu Oil Company yeah. property there? I think you're right. I think they're each over, just over 2,000 gallons each. Oh, well, I think they're bigger than that, aren't they? Actually, yeah, I think they're, actually, I'd have to double check. Those hold tankers. Those are 10,000 gallon. Is that what they are? I, okay. I, I could be wrong, but I think those. And, and 2,000 gallons is kind of a standardized format following state fire marshal, like a grid. When you look at how they enforce setbacks and volatility, they, they kind of use that as kind of a, a benchmark standard. I'm not sure exactly in the rationale for that, but I do know that's a very common practice to use a 2,000 gallon standard. If you're above that, we should probably take more of a look at it versus if it's less than 2,000, it's going to be addressed through fire marshal standards and building code standards. Other questions, comments? So you changed what was already in here in the code right now, down, took it down to the 2000, right? Mm -hmm. 25 to 2. Now this fire marshal grid. Elaborate if you can on why twenty five thousand is no longer acceptable. I'm not saying it's not acceptable. I'm just saying that is a standard that they would say once you reach that mark. Um, usually, there's other standards in place that they have to um, add double wall tanks. And at a catch basin and things like that that I'm really not familiar with enforcing those standards. I mean, my, my, my job is kind of the zoning standards as far as how it protects the public health, safety, and welfare in the sense of does it impact properties? Does it visually impact them? Does it um, promote the general welfare of the public from a you know, sense of return on investment for property? That's kind of what I do. So as far as how it, Im I can't answer that, how it impacts. Sorry. But that's something I can look into if you're interested. Follow up. 
I could be wrong. I, I guess I would like to know what those other tanks that are out there. I'm just looking up online right now, and a 2,000-gallon tank is pretty small. It's yeah, like a I mean, farm it's, tank. Well, it's I what you'd mean, see on a... I mean, well, I mean, I know we have on our... Um, I, I want to say that they're... I want to say a transport is 10,000 gallons, but I could be <coughs> wrong. So if you're coming in with a transport, I, I know... It seems it. restrictive. Yeah, that's... I mean, I can double check, but I'm pretty sure that I think I'm right on that, but I could be wrong. Let me see what those tanks are that was just constructed. Does anyone have an LP tank or grew up with an LP tank on the... Let's see. Models are 500. 500. 1,000 and 2,000 would not be very large. <clears throat> no. That's why I think those... So on that... I think a transport. So on the Dillavu oil, there's on the uh, yard extras, on the assessor information, there's a 30,000 gallon tank, and there's a 12,000 gallon tank. Yeah, I thought those were good. Yeah. It, you're right. The 2,000 gallons, I mean, for example, the zoning request and the board of adjustment request, frankly, was for a 500 gallon diesel tank for fleet vehicles. But because it was a structure, it was a tank storing a, you know, flammable link, liquid, even though it was semi-non-volatile diesel, relatively speaking, as opposed to gasoline or LP or propane, it still technically met the requirement. And so to enforce the code, you know, across the board, I guess you could say just as it's written, that's what they needed to do. And so we really looked at that and said, you know, maybe this is appropriate to bring this forth for discussion to say, what is the point of no return? And maybe uh, what I'm hearing is perhaps a little more refinement into double checking what the thresholds are and coming back maybe before you make a decision on that. I'm I'm willing to do that. So mm -hmm. I think if we check out, you know, something that's actual out there, so we have yeah. the basic comparison. We had a uh, thousand gallon propane tank on, on our property and it was probably fifteen feet long and maybe three, three and a half feet in diameter. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. That's small. Yeah. So, and then on the FS uh, Advantage property, that's a 30,000 gallon tank as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the other one we're looking at. And that's the same property they wanted to locate the 500 gallon diesel tank. And so they're like, well, there's a 30,000. You know, so I don't know if 30,000 is the answer per se. I don't know if that's something, you know, across the board. I don't know. There's There are standards for that. And I don't know if these are grandfathered in or what, you know, the exact story on these is. So say one more time, if, if it's in an M1, yep. you would be able to locate a tank up to how big? 2,000. Up to 2,000 gallons, and then you can have no more than two tanks that size or less on the property. Okay, if you want more than that, you need to come to the Board of Adjustment. It's envisioned there and ask for a variance. And then M2? M2, it was um, no less than 2,000 gallons. So it has to be greater than 2,000 gallons. Yeah, and then it would come to the Board of Adjustments. So if, if somebody wanted to do a 30,000 gallon tank for whatever reason or rationale, you know, be in the farm industry we're in, the question would be, let's look at the M2 properties, let's, you know, play that out. And so we kind of did, and what we figured out is there are M2 properties that are next to residential. You have, believe it or not, Nestle is an M2. Um, right across the street is residential than 200 feet, but we try to do is say less than 200 feet to the to the R district um, uh, structure, which is how I worded this versus property line, which gives you another 25, 30 feet to work with in most cases. Um, so we were just starting here and saying, uh, does this seem to make sense? So, you know, tank size, um, 2,000 gallons is pretty standard. When I looked at, uh, for example, I looked at City of Coralville, I looked at Iowa City, I looked at much smaller communities um, in Iowa. Um, that's usually kind of everybody's different, but 2,000 gallons seem to kind of show up more than once. And when you play that out, it, like Hank was saying too, for personal LP, 1,000 gallons is decent size. And if you get more than that, well, are you residential or are you kind of industrial? And do you want that? It's, you know, if you're next to an R district, so that's the whole key here is. Size-wise, we're capping you, but distance-wise, it only comes into play if you're in our district. 
So maybe we don't need to capsize. I don't know. I'm gathering the sense of the group is that let's take it back, mm -hmm. take another look at it, and come back next month and uh, see if we can't uh, put a bow around it. Is that the sense yeah, of the group? Sounds no. good. Okay. Okay. We can do that. Okay. There's no old business. Um, new business update from staff on updating the city ordinances governing residential zoning district classifications. So I think we hinted on this the last meeting. Um, so where we're at with it, we're still kind of researching the R districts. We're kind of looking at what's uh, coming down the pike with new residential. We're, we're playing out scenarios where um, what we're really focused on is zero lot line development. How can we, uh, if somebody ever wanted to do that, like a, a townhome development, because technically you can't own the yard space in addition to your structure, you would have to put the yard space in a condo regime or under a third party ownership, usually with an association, and then allow your condo units to touch and, and be connected in that fashion. If somebody wanted to do a town home or a what I'm calling a town home is where you would own the yard space and typically you're a little more narrow than traditional lot sizes. If anybody wanted to do that, they can't do that in Waverly. So in the spirit of just kind of saying, well, let's start at looking at um, R1 at, in terms of R1 typically would mean R1, one family on a lot. Let's look at R1 small, R1 large. Then you have an R2, which would allow only duplex construction, not single family as well. So again, we're kind of allowing developers to say, painting a picture for us to say when they apply for a zoning designation, let's say they wanted to designate it like an R3 or an R4. What that means today is you can do single family, you can do duplex, you can do multifamily, you can do light office commercial, but that's not R4. I mean, it is in the terms of how we allow for it in our ordinance today, but we're looking at it's just kind of I guess peeling back and peeling out some of those uses that are repetitive that lead up to that point and just saying if it's R1, it's R1. If you're doing duplexes, it's R2. If you're doing R3s, you know, you're three or more units attached, that's an R3, not duplexes. So you kind of follow. Mm -hmm. So, and again, too, we're going to look at how planned developments work um, to say um, how do we want that to work? And what we envision too is, is asking some of our commission members like on this commission tonight to help us out with that too. Um, I know I talked to the chair a little bit about that initially too. And so what we envision is some participation from planning and zoning commission. We want some participation from economic development commission. We want some participation from builders. We want some participation from our city council. Um, obviously not a quorum, but uh, just a, uh, basically what we want is a representation from each of the impacted areas, I'd call it, and so that we can have some good input and spirit of discussion kind of on the forefront. But we're not quite to the point where we're kind of at a landing spot where we're saying we're ready to present something to discuss right now. And what we envision then is giving some, getting, receiving some feedback from, is this hitting the mark or is it missing it? And where are the loopholes in that? So that's where we're at with the process right now. We're still finishing that up, hopefully within the next, um, few weeks we should have that finalized and we'll start reaching out to the commission council members um, builders and seeing what they think so you're looking probably for two members perhaps from this commission and well what we envision is a couple members maybe three from each of our commissions you know two or three builders two two or three council members but just kind of keeping it relatively small from each group so that we can have a bigger group and the uh, table of discussion i guess you could say could be represented who it may impact in the and seeing if we're hitting the marks on what's envisioned for moving Waverly forward. Is this solving a problem that we're trying to solve? And again, the problem I think we're having is it seems like when somebody comes forth with an R4, boy, it's just a wild card. It just seems, you know, people get bristled up and they don't know what to, what's going on. And there's some real questions, and rightfully so, because it does allow for that in our code today. And I, I think when we really looked at that, we, we thought, well, there's probably a better way to do this. When we looked at other communities, they do it that way. Maybe we should really open that up a little bit for discussion, see where it goes. Is that the same thing that Bill talked to me asking about the, the rewriting the code? It probably that? is. That's the one, because he asked me if I'd set the one to... Yep. Okay. I know, Bill, I think he had a conversation with you about that. Uh, I don't know what meeting, but yeah, he had mentioned he had talked to you about that. You know? 
No, I, I decided to <laughs> you know if that was the same, if we were talking the same thing, yeah. that yep. you'd ask if yeah. I'd sit on that. So that's where we're at. That's where Bill's office and, and I are working on that. So I think it's a good way to work. I think we proved it when we were doing the, uh, uh, the barriers program. <clears> and uh, I think uh, we're seeing the same kind of thing with the work on the corridor planning. Get a couple of people together to kind of noodle it out and... Uh, Speaking of the corridors, could we get a copy of the chart that you put forward a month ago? Because that was well done, and I didn't memorize it. You didn't? Oh, it, it should be in the Planning and Zoning Commission Agenda Manager. Oh. So if you go into the Agenda Manager, if you find the uh, September uh, Planning and Zoning Commission, it's still yeah. online. That's the okay. benefit of using Agenda Manager. Everything you see there is always right there at your fingertips. And if you need assistance with using that, like when you're at home, just let me know and I'll walk you through it because you can access it through our City of Waverly website through City Council and under recent agendas. Again, you'll see it very similar. Then you can pull down Planning and Zoning Commission and it's right there. Very good. All the attachments are right there for you. <laughs> okay. The, uh, I wanted to make a comment before we adjourn wanted to express uh, the thanks of the commission to uh, Susan Frankie for her service on the commission. I think, as all of you know, she's elected to, to resign her seat. Uh, I sent out a note to ask you if you know of people that should be brought to the attention of the mayor, please do that. Uh, he hasn't heard from anyone as yet. Uh, we, we have compiled a listing of, of potential folks, but you folks have a good sense about the kind of balance that this commission needs, and if you know of someone that should be considered, please let the mayor know, and uh, he, he would appreciate that very much. We'd like to get it filled. We, uh, we still have a quorum requirement of five, even though we only have eight members, uh, because our quota is, is <coughs> nine. The, the, the quorum remains uh, the same, so. Um, Try to talk about this mayor a little bit, Greg. Female, thinking we should replace it with a female, and, and they had no interest. So I'm, <laughs> I'm having drawing blanks right well, now. You know, the mayor and I had talked about this, and I said, you know, what we're looking is for people who have the capacity to think. Uh, we we've got good balance, and whether we're uh, five four or four five or whatever, uh, if if we get nine good people sitting here. We're going to do some good things for this city. And I think he's of a like mind that uh, if uh, one of the males leave, that doesn't mean that a male is going to be appointed. We'll, we'll look to find the mm -hmm. very best people we can <clears throat> to join in this work. And I think, he's got, I think he's got the right idea how to go about it. So let him know. I have a law requires to be gender balanced, so. It's impossible to be balanced when you're not a nine-member commission. Well, I know, but I mean, <laughs> it can't be. You, you look or you know, I don't know what it is, but, <laughs> but I, mean, I, I just figured we need to replace it. And I, I think you just need to make an attempt. I mean, just do mm -hmm. the best you can, and well, I think it is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is, but I know that the, that's what the intent of the law was to. Yep. The intent was to make sure that people across the board were considered. People have access to the process. Yeah. 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 Let me bring this up too. Um, I guess I had a comment. There's been recently in in the papers and, and kind of covered through the press um, about just great bike communities in the state of Iowa. Um, Cedar Rapids was noted. They they noted Cedar Falls. Des Moines is making great efforts of taking some of your roadways and you know basically dedicating bike lanes, and that's something we haven't done in the city of Waverly. Um, might be something for leisure services. I think it comes to this commission as well. Maybe it has something to do with the corridor, but um, um, last month we talked about Fifth, um, Fifth Avenue Northwest and that corridor from the college into Coleman Park in downtown. Um, it might be a great way like you and I did, or excuse me, Cedar Falls did, to bridge to you and I, they did 18th Street. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think they're, you know, around the lane could be a natural too. I just don't know if it's wide enough, but that's where we, you see a lot of active walkers, joggers, bikers, things like that. And, and maybe that's something that could be taken to city staff to at least start looking at at some of our wider corridors 
and then maybe we could, you know, dedicate some of those lanes and, and things like that, um, especially in those areas where we don't. Um, I thought of Fifth Avenue because it's kind of, it's a dead end to our trail system. We have nothing really that goes to the west. And so you need to, to continue to, to find ways to, to bridge different neighborhoods and things like that. I saw an article, and I think it was in the Iowan, where they, and I believe it was Des Moines that was being cited, but they had uh, moved the parking away from the curb about four to five feet and parked the cars in a straight line. I noticed, I was in Cedar Rapids last night, and there was a neighborhood that had done that. Yeah. I was confused at first because I had never seen it before. Yeah, so the bike lane became the lane between the parked cars and the sidewalk. I think it's going to be good for my mm -hmm. family. And so, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's Waverly as a progressive community. I think it's something that we need to model ourselves after some of the larger communities that are doing it. It comes down to wellness and all of those other mm -hmm. things that Good go idea. along with yeah. it. So, and especially when you have a college and you're trying to bridge that college to the downtown area, let's find a way to get them there. Good. Let's just go around the horn real quick. Barb, anything for the good of the order? No, I don't have anything. Rich? All is good. I just got a question, and I've had numerous people ask me, are, and I haven't caught every city council, but is, are we seriously looking at going to three lane in the, on Main Street with just going from four to two lanes with a turning lane in the middle? Tim, what's been discussed at council? On Bremer? Yes. Yeah. That is one of the proposals that's been uh, discussed with us is going there. Um, we have not gone fully into those kind of discussions. So it'll be notified out to the, the community. It'll, yeah, there'll be hearings and whatnot <clears throat> before we, we get to that point. Um, the same thing is being discussed with 4th Street uh, going down from where they're doing working right now, but then going south to, towards the Burger King area would be to continue that as, a, as essentially a three-lane, make that three-lane with the center turning lane. That's That's been discussed, too, and as when we, we get to that project. When we get to that many project. years. And, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. So... But Bremer, yes, Bremer, they certainly have talked about that. They talked about it with us a couple of years ago about possibly doing that section from the railroad going west to the four-way stop uh, and making that three-lane uh, at that point. Um, and w they didn't move anything forward with that, but that was a discussion at that point. Yeah, I just have heard a lot of comments. Yep. So I'll just pass on that they'll be not community notified and yep. they can come and say, Yep. Tell you how crazy you are for even thinking about it. That's what they're telling me. Well, that'll be that'll be a lot with what what the state decides to do since it is a state road. No, I understand. And we I we have yes. input as a community, and of course we we control the parking lanes there for for the good portion of Bremer Avenue. So. It's tough to get across town now, and I think it'd be even tougher. I mean, you go from about three o'clock to five thirty, it is awful tough to get it's across tight. town. Yeah. So that's. Kathy? I'm good. Kate? I'm fine. Bill? It's good. You get the last word. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't ask me if I was good. I was asking questions. <laughs> Just kidding. That's a good question. We need a motion. A motion to adjourn. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much.